All right, so I've put this in um, in the diagram just to let you see basically the timeline. Okay, we begin from 1880. You, of course, you can go uh, be, before that. If you look at the Islamic empire, it we will also learn that it has free trade and economy throughout the empire. There was basically no borders. That was why it flourished uh, very well, okay, during its, its golden era and towards uh, uh, 1600, 1500, when at the time the in the West, uh, it was basically still in the stage of, a, uh, we call that as the Middle Ages, all right? And then uh, 1900, you see World War, 1914, World War One, And then this is where I have mentioned just now, the gunboat diplomacy was basically uh, a practice at that time. And then towards World War II, uh, then after World War II, that was when we had the United Nations Charter, and uh, that was when nation states were, were built. Well, basically, when we talk about reimagining borders, international law itself was an imagination of the change of borders before 1945. So after 1945, we have nation states, and that is uh, what we know today by nation states. And uh, by that, uh, after the World War II, you, uh, that is where the first BIT, the first bilateral investment treaty was entered into by Pakistan and Germany in 1959. You can also imagine Germany at that time was uh, very much um, troubled by the war. After the war, it had uh, basically the, the system, the, the facilities collapsed, but they wanted to develop the country. So that was one of, that was the first BIT uh, with Pakistan in 1959. And what, what followed afterwards was many countries then uh, also took initiative to do the same, but they did that by way of uh, bilateral, uh, bilateral relations. Okay, also here, I've mentioned just now as well, the because of the war in 1914 and because of other factors, uh, there was this collapse of global economy. And uh, before this, before the war, I've mentioned just now, it was, it was a very prosperous in international trade and investment, but after the war, they uh, left this uh, liberalism idea towards uh, nationalist economic policies. And then there was a Great Depression, okay, and then Russian Revolution, these are all events. Uh, and during these events, what, what we as uh, students of international investment law would scan is to see um, which in which part uh, our informations that are related to um, investment protections, okay, to concepts relating to international investment law. Okay, for example, the, the concept of compensation uh, was discussed in the case concerning uh, the factory of Chazo, right? That one is named 1928. And then uh, we also understood the need of international cooperation, the League of Nations 1920. Now, even when the even in the promulgation of the EU countries, they also were of the view after World War II, is that if we uh, cooperate with each other, if we do business with each other, then there is a chance that we will not be warring with each other. We will not have war with each other. So that's basically the idea, right? Okay. And then World War II aggravated the breach of protections for investors, et cetera. We will look at this afterwards. And then what happened after the first BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty between Pakistan and Germany, uh, there was an explosion okay, of bilateral investment treaties. This is something, this was something uh, very unprecedented at that time. Okay, by the end of 1980s, a number of 385 bilateral investment treaties was entered into. And you know, sometimes these treaties were, uh, were very much intertwined with each other. For example, Malaysia has one with uh, Thailand, and then Thailand has another one with some, somebody else. And then that somebody else and Thailand and Malaysia has another treaty with some, somebody else, right? So well, basically, that was what was this described by some scholars as a spaghetti bowl of uh, investment treaties. So I've mentioned just now, the word they use is explosion of investment treaty arbitrations as well. So when you have these treaties, I mentioned just now, one of the main element in the treaty is if there is a breach, investors can bring claims against the states. So by that, there was also an explosion of arbitrations full of these claims, right? Okay, uh, in the timeline also, I've mentioned about other regional treaties or sectoral treaties like we have 
Energy Charter Treaty is a treaty based on the sector of energy, right? Okay, and then NAFTA is between uh, United Nations, United States of America, Canada, and Mexico. WTO is on trade in 1995. And then you see here by 2020, more than 2,600 international investment agreements were enforced, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now we are in 2022, um, COVID strikes, and we will also see what will happen afterwards until 2040. Now we are in the pre uh, transition policies. You know, these treaties which states enter into, normally they have time span of 20, 10 years, 20 years, something like that, okay? So states which enter into treaties in 1980 for 20 years, so you will see that the treaties are ending 2000, and we also see that the trend right now is states are trying to renegotiate okay, the um, kandungan, okay, the the contents of the treaty uh, to incorporate um, current concerns. Okay. Uh, are we okay right now? Following? Boleh eh, Noila? Ah, yes. Yes. Okay. All right, now, so when we talk about foreign direct investment, we are not talking about uh, investments which are in the form of portfolio investments. Yang, when you talk about, you know, banking in area, finance, finance area, uh, you normally talk about. But we are talking about foreign direct investment that is basically when um, uh, if direct foreign, foreign investors come to a state or we, we in this context, we call it, we, we say come to our state and then sink their investments in physically in our state. So for example, if I can show you, um, like when we have uh, multinational companies in our country, we, we sometimes you see, for example, um, KFC or um, what? There's so many, right? There's so many. I will show you in another in another another slide. So many examples around us. You see KFC, McDonald's, Pizza Hut. Okay, those are uh, um, uh, chains which you have in many countries. So basically not only involve Malaysians, it involve uh, also foreign investors. So the reason why they come to our country is because they feel confident with our country because our country has signed treaties with their country, okay? So they have to check when they come and go see where they should go for investment, they will see, all right, okay, so Malaysia, well, it looks okay. So Malaysia, where is, does Malaysia, has Malaysia got any treaty with our country? They will have to check those things in order for them to be uh, to be secured. And when we sign those treaties and when we adopt, for example, when we have the AIC, for example, we say we adopt um, uh, the similar standard of protections, they will find it familiar, okay? They find it familiar. And if there is any case uh, dispute, then these disputes will be brought to arbitration and they will also feel uh, comfortable with that because by way of arbitration, they know that we are not directing any dispute to go to the local courts, okay? So, you know what uh, the, 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 the thinking of foreign investors is, if any dispute occur, and if we have to go to the uh, local courts, and if the law is not familiar to us, then um, it would also be um, uh, a stopping factor from them to come to do investment. So you can see foreign investors will consider the favorable fiscal regime, okay, the environment, uh, environmental environment condition, uh, okay, predictable and stable legal regime, existence of international investment agreement between host states and home state, whether the state party is a party to the New York Convention. So the New York Convention is a treaty which, um, which the states oblige themselves to enforce and recognize awards. So if you have a dispute with a host state, you go to an arbitral tribunal, the arbitral tribunal gives you an award, that is the decision. So you bring the award, for example, if the award, award contains that the state has to pay you an amount of money, okay, or an individual has to pay you an amount of money, okay, so they will bring this award to any state which, to the state that they, will, they would require to. And if that state is a member of the New York Convention, then they know that they will get whatever that is stipulated in the award. So if your country is not a member to the New York Convention, that would be also uh, a demotivating factor, okay? And you will, the country will also be considered as 
not having a friendly investment climate. Okay, so foreign investors must also consider a low political risk. We do not want countries which is very unstable in the sense that if there is anything happen, the state will, you know, uh, will not guard foreign investors investments. We just leave invest foreign investors, for example. We allow, for example, uh, uh, attacks uh, by, by riots, etc., on foreign investment. So those are high political risks. Or if they know that that state, um, uh, their law is very un unpredictable in the sense that uh, there are always new regulations okay, which affect their business, that is also as considered as high political risk. Okay, so the host states, why do host states want foreign investors to come, even though foreign uh, host states know that if they accidentally, you know, if they uh, breach the protections, then they will be brought to arbitral tribunal. And you know, if you uh, a state, if it is brought to arbitral tribunal, and if the state has to pay, the damages, the compensation is a huge amount, okay? and it will involve uh, the taxpayers' money. <clears throat> but the host states are still, you know, um, still host states still encourage uh, foreign investment because they want economic development. They want to. Um, they want to mobilize and they want to utilize the natural resources. They want to build their infrastructures, to build highway, to build uh, airports, okay, to build, et cetera, to provide services. It wants to create friendly investment climate. Yeah, it wants to um, uh, transfer technology and also provide job opportunity for the people. And they also want the flow of capital. So there's one article uh, which is uh, written uh, by one scholar I've read it talks about why do least developed countries or developing countries want foreign investments when they know uh, investment treaties will hurt them. Okay, but still we we are doing this because we are also benefiting from globalization. It allows globalization to happen. That is why if you walk uh, into some countries, okay, uh, from your own perspective, you will see that some countries are way back behind in terms of development. Where probably it is it is because of the uh, political environment and etc. Okay, or well, which may not be as friendly as we have in our part of the country. All right, so there are a number of standards of protections. I think I missed that slide. I don't know where that slide is. But basically, there are these bilateral investment treaties, even though they are entered into bilaterally by states, but they um, they uh, consist of similar standards of protections, 